Hey, Mark, what's up, man? Hey, Thomas. Wow. Thanks yeah. for having me on board here. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed you don't have a red background, though. Are you okay over there? What's what's going on? I, d I don't have a red background. I have a, a variegated background. I didn't, even, I didn't even blur it like we do a lot of times with Zoom so people can, I guess, peek into a bit of my, uh, you know, dining and living room area if they so choose and look at some of the still like, That's some interesting yeah. movie stills. To be like, what's what was what he got? Paintings, you know, and you're trying right. to have a, a decent conversation. You do like a Where's Waldo thing with what's in the background, or you yeah. Know. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I, I really wanted to get you on the show for many a reasons. Uh, one one being that we're friends, yeah. uh, which is probably the most important reason. I, I like to talk to my buddies, yeah. and uh, you know, with the pandemic, as as that's uh, right. Yeah, we don't really get a chance to, so it's nice to right. <laughs> get out there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you know, as a writer. Do you feel like maybe this pandemic has absolutely, I don't know, given us a chance to steamroll work or is it really, is it slowed you down? Because I, I know you're all over the place, you know, you, you write for different kind of literature outlets and I know you do stuff with the Oscars occasionally, um, but you have your own series and everything. Like, did you feel like, oh, the pandemic, here you go. I'm going to just bust out 12 more books like Brandon Sanderson. Well, yeah, you think you think that. I mean, going in, you say, "Well, I'm oh, and, and writers are are lucky if you if you're fortunate enough to make at least some of your or all of your income as a writer." And I I make about maybe half and half as teaching. A lot of writers teach. A lot of writers far more famous and accomplished than I have to teach because even writing and being well received in writing, depending what it is, if you're if you're writing books novels, especially as opposed to say creating TV series, you're going to get compensated at much different levels. Um, but none, but nonetheless, writers are still fortunate enough that they have an innately flexible work from home kind of model. They've already been already been, uh, you know, laboring under and with. So so having to adapt with with stay at home rules was probably a lot easier for those of us who had been kind of working that way anyway. And you do kind of fantasize that, well, now everybody's doing everybody's staying at home and including me, but but amplified. And I'll just get that much more productive. But. With all the, I don't know, the tensions and all the things we all have to worry about and friends and family, in this case, getting COVID and travel and taking care of ourselves and all these things, it wasn't necessarily more productive. It wasn't less, actually. And we could talk about this later. I mean, and I actually work, I, I'm a, the writing I do that I'm most frequently compensated for, I guess, let's say this is the most regular kind of work I do is as a, a journalist or columnist. I write two different columns on, on showbiz and it's, a, you know, and it's discontents and it's production, you know, and looking behind the scenes of production, one for a British film magazine, it's a monthly column. And then I do a weekly column for an online publisher here in LA, more about kind of the culture and politics of yeah. entertainment. Um, and, and my, my freelancing actually increased. I mean, I thought the first thing to go would be freelance writing. I didn't even have a I, kind of these ongoing freelance. I thought it'd be the first thing cut from any budget. I wound, I did wind up being busier as a journalist during COVID than I was the two years prior. I actually had more assignments. It was probably because they were <laughs> like, well, people at home, let's see if we can get them reading the online formats. And yeah. just, you know, and be like, hey, Mark, you uh, doing anything this weekend? <laughs> You're like, no, I'm home. Well, th that's right. And advertisers kind of stop because they didn't have anywhere else to go, really. So at least in this, this silo of the economy, advertisers mostly stuck with the publications and productions were still coming out. And people still wanted to talk about them. Um, in my case, I talked to a lot of cinematographers, visual effects supervisors, production designers, etc. So there were still these conversations to be had. So we're, so it kind of went on, uh, you know, like it like it had been. Other than nobody was going out to meet anybody in person or go to a screen and any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I, I was somehow counterintuitively, I was actually busier as far as deadlines. But as, as far as like my, manifesting my own on the storytelling side. That, yeah. that still had its usual challenges as far as the new book or the new script. You know? Now, uh, you're, you you said something that's uh, pretty common for writers is the challenge. You know, the I need you know I need to be inspired. And um, one thing I, I usually tell people, and I'm sure I'm sure you feel the same way, especially when you get hired to write an article or something like that. It's like I'm not really being paid uh, to wait for inspiration. I'm being paid right. to be inspired. Like I right. I can't be like I'll do the gig. But I'm going to need a couple of weeks uh, until right. the sun is reflecting the right way yeah. off the outside. But when it comes to your own works, do you hold yourself to the same level of accountability 
as as per se a job, or, you know, writing for Vanity Fair, uh, Vanity or Los Angeles Times or something yeah, like that. I I probably don't. Um, I, I I have written for the Times in the past. I've yet to write for Vanity Fair as far as that goes. But I have written for various other interesting uh, publications. But no, uh, because the deadline. I mean, there's this immediate deadline. There's a weekly column, which I've started thinking about like by by eight, Thursday of every week because I have to get it in today. In fact, when we're done with this, I have to finish the column that's due at the end of day Monday because it goes up every Tuesday. And then there's my monthly column that's due on its own cycle about the middle of every month. And I have to start that in the next few days as well. So those kind of demand my attention. And then I do some teaching. I, I also teach. I'm a faculty an assistant or adjunct faculty even, you know, for an online online college and teach sort of practical writing for, for adults. Not so much creative writing, but just practical communication skills for people who don't necessarily aspire or need to write a book of their own. Yeah, um, so just, that's right. They just want to know how to like write a clearer email, you know, things like that, and have just have confidence doing it. Which is surprising how many people don't actually have confidence in their communication skills. Yeah, would like, you say a common thing about emails is when people write like "Hi, my name is you know Thomas yeah, J. Beleza," that's and right, I'm, and you're like, but you're already saying it at the end. You're wasting. That's words. right. Yeah, yeah. Right. I always thought that was funny. Where it's like, yeah. I don't need to know who you are in the beginning. I didn't know just why am I reading this email is what I need to know in the beginning. That's yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. And a, a technique that I was taught growing up was um, let the first, you know, one or two sentences actually be about them because people are interested yeah. in themselves. So if they're yeah. reading something about themselves, like, oh, so, oh, yeah, that's right. I did yeah. do that, you know. And yeah. uh, so I always say, you know, work on them and their past and then it should be you and your wants and then yeah. end it with them and their future. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a good, strong, concise email. And uh, but it's always the same. They'll always like write like one small thing like, hey, you worked on blah, blah, blah. And then it's a chunk of everything I want. And then it's always like, take care. And you're like, no, you you got to. <laughs> it's not all about you. No one cares that's about right. you. It's, it's about them. You know, so that's interesting that uh, you teach uh, that, that technique. Um, but back back to going to like uh, having trouble or or finding yourself, you know, looking at a white screen, thinking yeah. of a white room. Right. Um, you know, you you have you have four books right now uh, currently in the uh, Danger Boy series, right? Correct. Four books in Danger Boy. Yeah, I've, I have five books that I've that have been out. Not that I've, I've written a few more than those, but four of my Danger Boy series, kind of from earlier in the two thousands, a time travel series for young adults, and then I had a, a, a zombie novel. Yep. Um, from, from a smaller publisher that came out about, gosh, four years ago now. And um, it's been optioned for a streaming series by a friend of mine who is a cinematographer turned director. And he and his partner, they wrote a script and they're shopping it. That is, you know, to, to be optioned is great. I also have been around long enough to know that that means sort of nothing as far as um, the, the likelihood. I mean, it, I guess in, in, in a theoretical way, it increases the likelihood of a thing becoming a film or a series, but not to the absolute degree that people imagine. I mean, so many things get optioned. And then they optioned, they go into development, active development, and even none of that necessarily means it'll go into production. Yeah. yeah. Well, when, when uh, like, I'm, I'm sure you know about how this works with, with writing a script and stuff. Sometimes a studio just keeps licensing it. They just, right. And they, you're just, and you're like, I hope they don't make it because as long as they're licensing it every year, every two years, I'm getting yeah. paid a chunk of money, you know, and, once it, once they make it, you might not make any more money because it might not do well, or they might film it and shelf it, or whatever the case may be. Um, the late Ed Abbey used to say that he had his book, The Monkey Wrench Gang, which many of us read in the seventies, which is about people going around monkey wrenching bulldozers and tractors and dams and to try to actually the actual destruction of the earth to try and physically stop the destruction of the earth. So it, it was controversial in its outlook. Uh, the, the book would get optioned, especially in its the crisis uh, and the biosphere would get worse and worse. Yeah. And but Abby, Ed, he used to say um, he hoped the movie never got and the movie still hasn't been made because of its controversial <laughs> subject matter. But for him, that suited him because different producers would just keep optioning it. And he said, as long as they don't ever make it, I'm fine because I will get money every few. Exactly that. Yeah, and, and, and you make a good money. living too. Like That's a lot of right. writers, they're like, I got four projects that'll never see the light. But That's don't right. you want to see it made? No, I I write to get paid. Yeah. Like you know, I'm not, and I, you know. I think that's that's definitely an issue with writers that they kind of confuse the difference between I want to have a career as a writer versus I want to be a writer yeah. thinking that's going to be a career. And the, right. the major difference between a career as a writer and just being a writer is you need to get paid. 
to have a career. And right. it doesn't necessarily mean that you're writing, um, you know, just your books. And, and like, like you said, you know, you write for several different outlets and it helps pay the bills, but you're still in your industry. You're helping people learn how to write, but yeah. you're also writing articles and you, and you, you know, you do research on things and then you, you have the monthly articles, so, uh, but you also get to write your own books. And, uh, you know, what do you, what are your thoughts on that when it comes to uh, basically the business brain versus the artist brain where it's like ultimately i want to be a successful career writer but they don't really understand that it's a business they just think i need to just write and write and write and that'll help me be successful what are your thoughts on that yeah to some degree you know there is this this whole throw the spaghetti against the wall school which is just keep writing enough and networking enough and you know, if you look at, say, screenwriting, screenwriting Twitter, they'll tell you. It's, I mean, there's, uh, you just keep writing scripts, keep making good samples, keep entering contests, keep networking your way to have, to keep querying agents, and you know, this kind of persistence it can it can pay off for people. And the same on the on the novel writing side and, and kid lit too. But there's also kind of the the burnout. You can also be published and be successful for a while, but then besides breaking in, there's also the question of maintaining. A career at a certain level, which is not something that nobody, that anybody tells you about. You know, no one kind of thinks. Well, you think that once you get a break, it'll be everything will be automatically self-sustaining <laughs> after that, and yeah. it's not. And nobody tells you that really, unless they tell. I mean, it's not. It's not. It's the inertial mass. The it does not necessarily automatically mean you will always be employed as a writer, even if you once were or managed to be for a while. So there's all these additional considerations uh, on the course and during the course of your life and your career that you have to. Uh, consider including flexibility and writing for different writing different things at different times for different platforms or in different media as well yeah and uh you know to that point when you know you write a book and let's say let's say you write the book and mm -hmm. you're a first time author and it gets picked up and the publisher's right. like hey i'm going to give you $30,000 yeah up front and they're like, this is a really great book. But for some reason, the marketing's bad or, you know, you as a uh, writer don't really feel comfortable doing, uh, you know, interviews. So you don't go on the radio. You don't go on, you know, and like, I'm going to put you on this press tour. And it's like, no, I just want to write. And it, so you push back on it. You're not Stephen King. Like Stephen King could be like, I'm not going on a press tour. Right. You know, but right. like when you're starting out and they do all these things and then they're like, we're, we're not going to pick up your second book. And they're like, why not? Why not? I, I was writing it. And it's like, well, we gave you money uh, to help you sustain to write, but also to afford you to go to these press, you know, really uh, the press meetings and all this, the press junkets and stuff. Um, have you ever felt uh, like when you get a, if you ever gotten money up front for one of your books and stuff like that, have you ever felt like, oh, this is it. I got my money. Well, uh, you no, know, the, the money you get up front and most, unless you're really, unless you're already a celebrity, you know, a big have a bunch of TikTok followers. It's interesting now that the public is, there's so few publishers. It's like much of the, um, the journal, much of the media landscape, film journalism, it's becoming increasingly compressed with the, the, the few that the small handful of companies that are on all these different outlets. And therefore the decision-making is more and more concentrated into unfortunately fewer and fewer hands. Yeah. But with, with books, especially unlike say writers guild minimums for um, episodic TV, even let alone feature films, um, book advances are really much punier than people realize, even at fairly good, especially early on. If you become famous enough and you have a good enough agent, they can maybe they can approximate, a, you know, a salary for a year's worth of, of living expenses. But it's rare. I mean, everybody's like a million dollar advances. I mean, yeah. that, that is so rare. I'm not saying they don't exist, but but the majority of writers who get published get really puny four four and small five figure advances. And they get no marketing. I'm like, you're saying about we're going to send you on a radio. My God, where is the publisher that will send anybody on a radio tour? And publishers say, yeah, they want you. How many, what's your platform? How many followers do you have on this yeah. on Twitter or TikTok? They want you to be to do the marketing. And yet at the same time, marketing committees in-house have more and more power that's being taken out of the hands of editors. I've actually had, I'm not the only one. We compare sort of grumpy notes sometimes, but projects can be killed by marketing committees, projects that editors want. Yeah, I had, an, I had an anthology once with a friend of mine that she was running through. It was actually going to be a comics anthology. And the marketing committee killed it because they weren't sure how they could market it. Um, <laughs> so, so they they killed the book, even though she wanted to do it. And I, ideally, 
or in theory, in theory, her job as an editor, the reason she was brought on, was to they were hiring her partly for her 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 sensibility, her 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 radar, her antenna, her scintilla, if you will, in terms of finding projects and bringing them in. Um, but then it, when they didn't trust her as far as their own bottom line. Yeah, I mean, it's a business, you know, in a publishing company, they're looking at an ROI. So if they're looking at a, a writer who has a huge following and, and right. tons of impression and react, you know, it's like, wait, we don't have to put a lot of money into the marketing. We'll just give them, like you said, a, you know, three, a four or five figure, if that. You know, and I have a friend who has a massive following. He built his, his name, like doing a lot of crazy marketing on his own. He built his own business, you know, yeah. and he was not a writer. He's just not interested in writing. He had yeah. his thing that he was doing. And a publishing company came to him and said, hey, we're going to give you like $300,000 to write a book. And he was like, yeah. I will write a book. And then he went and hired a ghostwriter. Right. And he just recorded into a thing. And then he's like, write the book. And. You know, again, like to what you're saying is if you have the brand value, people are willing to give you a couple extra dollars because they know that the ROI is going to be better on their end. But if you if you don't have the potential for a strong ROI or return on your investment, they're not going to give you that upfront money. Um, and in the music industry, that's that's where I started is uh, if a record label gave you money like thirty or forty thousand dollars up front. That money was not for you to go buy a house or a car or equipment. It was for you to pay for a PR company or, or you know, a publicist. It was for you to handle your own marketing. It was for you to you know master your your tape. Uh, that's how old I am. Tapes. Yes, that's uh, right. yeah. <laughs> What's a tape? You mean yeah, stick exactly. it to the wall? Yeah. Well, I started out typing my first <laughs> typing. What's that? Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> no. Um. I sometimes put the uh, typewriter sound on my computer. So when I'm yes, writing, yes. it is comforting. For those yeah. of a certain <laughs> age. Yes. Right. It is right. It has like that, like kind of yeah. white noise. Like, and then yeah. when you hit enter, it goes. That's right. <laughs> um, and, and I think, I think it's important for authors and writers of the, like that are listening to this is, you know, you, you should have a game plan when you're, when you're deciding to be a writer, if you want to be a career writer, if you just like writing and you just self publish and you don't really care where it goes. And it's just, it's a passion of yours. This, this is really not for you as far as like, um, you know, educational, but the idea of like the moment you want to make money and a career at writing, you have to think like a business. And if you're going to go to a publisher and you have nothing to offer as far as like, well, you give me money, you make my book successful, and and I wrote the book, and that's why you should give me money. Right. You, you got to change your mentality a little bit. Um, and I, I think it's important uh, for me, you know, the way I look at it for authors to say to themselves, well, what, what am I offering as a brand, as a value that's more than my book? Because this book I'm writing – like you said, you know, you have a comic book series that, uh, like you said, it didn't, you know, it got pushed off because of marketing. You have your Danger Boy, you have the Zombie 500 um, series, and you have multiple series. So, like, mm -hmm. imagine you you only, well, no, I'm only going to do Danger Boy. And yeah. then you focused all your money and time and marketing on Danger Boy. You would have never got the opportunities to be a career writer where you are now because you'd be like, no, no, the only thing I'm going to do. I'm not even going to work for another magazine. I'm not going to, I don't want, I don't want anything. I'm just going to do danger boy. Like your, your career wouldn't go anywhere, you know? Yeah. I mean, you have to, I, I do, there, you do need to be flexible in terms of the work and where does the work take you? I know that when I sold danger boy originally and I'd not been published as a novelist, but I was working already as a journalist it was in the early days of um, the internet. This is what they call Internet 1.0 now. So this was the late late nineties, early two thousands, and I was I'd written Danger Harry Potter had come out during this time, and suddenly series series for young readers are a little bit dark were now in vogue, which I hadn't really planned on. That was kind of the luck part, um, because Danger Boy was my son, who's now at the end of his twenties, you know, married and a college graduate. My oldest son of my two, yeah. when he was a toddler, he he w ran down the hall saying, "I'm a Danger Boy, I'm a Danger Boy," and it seemed like such a good phrase to use that I couldn't resist it. And I had been a playwright uh, before then, before being a young dad. And, you know, I, and, but now I was busy as a journalist. I'd sort of, the playwriting led to actually some video game script doctoring, which I think maybe on the, the bio scroll there and the video game script doctor doctoring led to this 
perception, misguided as it may have been, that I was conversant on this new technology that was starting to bust out in the 90s. And I started to get freelance assignments writing about it, writing about video games, and writing about the brand new internet. And it's hard for people watching this to think of the internet being brand new and not taken for granted. But it was at one time. And they wanted writers who could explain what it meant for old media and old business models and not that I necessarily knew anything more than anybody else. But having wound up on these platforms, I kept getting assigned to talk to people who were basically smarter than me about these things. So I, I eventually learned enough to ask good questions. And I kept, and this just kept leading to this persistent freelance journalism career. And sometimes there'd be staff positions for a while at this publication or that. But I've been mo most steadily employed as a journalist uh, because of that. So at the time I was selling Danger Boy, I actually had bona fide journal journalism clips and it was still probably more clips than links in those days, maybe a few links, but mostly still even clips. And then those, and you'd print them out. You'd be published online, maybe you'd print them out. But in any case, what it told the edit, the book editors who were considering Danger Boy is that somebody else had already said yes to me, which was kind of a right. So, so they would, didn't have to be the first yes. And not that you can't sell a first book. In fact, now sometimes a first novelist is more exciting to them than a, an established novelist who's, who's not, at a Stephen King level, because there's all of this theoretical potentiality. Yeah. So, you know, so you do have an advantage as, a, as an unknown novelist uh, compared to a known novelist who maybe isn't as huge as they'd imagine they wanted to be at one time. But nonetheless, having written other things helped me get my foot in the door as a book writer as well. And then conversely, being a book writer later helped when I was going for teaching jobs and things like that. Well, this guy must know a little bit about writing because this column and now book. So I guess he knows enough to have gotten published. So I've also been fairly steadily employed as a writing teacher as well for a long time. So these things all kind of help nourish each other. Yeah, it's the malleability that you're willing to say, I'm a writer, so I get to write. What do you need me to write? I yeah. will do it. And even teaching writing is has to be uh, something that's fulfilling, you know, because you're like, well, I get to literally teach the thing that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like you're saying with, with, you know, you wrote these books and you wrote this and you worked here and now you're teaching and like that. And that's all your brand. Like you're not being hired yeah. because you wrote Danger Boy. As you said, you're like, well, because I wrote a book, they were like, oh, somebody, you wrote a book, so maybe you can teach. And it wasn't necessarily right. that they read your book or That's they right. saw your numbers. And it's important for authors and, and new writers and things like that to think about that is don't place all of your energy into a book title mm -hmm. and place the energy into you, establishing you as an author so people generate interest in what you're doing. Uh, Stephen right. King, uh, people talk about Stephen King more than they talk about like the newest book that's coming out. Right, right. You know, well, and they'll just be like, Stephen King's coming out with a book. But they, it's not like when Carrie came, right, which was like his first real published right. book. Right. You know, like they were like, have you seen this book? This book is crazy. But then who he was became he doesn't do interviews. He's a recluse. He's a and then he was like, misery is based on my life. And they were yeah. like, whoa, whoa. And it created this uh, this this mystique to him, you know. Well, now, now he has a massive platform. He doesn't even need to do interviews. I mean, he can, but he just needs to send out a tweet at this point. And <laughs> You know. And he does. And he does. That's right. Yeah. Um, could we talk about, because uh, uh, one of the things that I do on this, uh, the right mindset mm -hmm. uh, channel mm -hmm. is uh, we explore the craft of writing, uh, basically outlining and, you know, the importance of certain things like an inciting incident and knowing mm -hmm. what an inciting incident mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, uh, though I have heard writers say, I, I don't, I don't need that. I just write. And that's mm -hmm. a pantser, but pantsers still need to have, certain beats certain uh right. you know points that happen when you when you write your novels uh what is your process in general do you brainstorm and then outline or do you how do you do it how, like walk us through your process to write a book yeah i'll tell you well my biggest well i it's true i do i, I finished a book that i just i co-wrote with my pal uh, douglas reese who's probably best known for a book called vampire high that came out uh, a, a ya a ya book um and he and I have a book that's up on Inkshares now, which is a crowdsourced platform. And it's a sort of a kid noir. We always wanted to bring kind of the noir genre to younger readers, the sort of middle, middle, mid grade is publishing calls it middle grade and YA readers. And so we have this detective who's um, a noir. He, he loves old film noir. He's kind of a film geek and he watches old Bogart films and things like that. Um, and 
and, and, and so we spent years on and off with the other projects working on this book, which is the inciting incident there is that a bomb goes off at this school dance and it's neo-Nazis. And at the time we started writing it, neo-Nazis were kind of this fringe, almost imaginary sort of, uh, you know, element in American society, as opposed to, you know, having members in the halls of Congress. Now you know, we have neo-Nazis that are actually members of Congress and the U.S. <laughs> Senate. So, um, and, and less and less ashamed about declaring themselves such in so many words. Um, so the book has taken on a kind of unexpected currency, unfortunately, that over the years. But when we'd write that, so that was a process where we would, we kind of outlined it together or sketched it out. And, and then we would, one of us would write a chapter and email it to the other. And then we'd rewrite that chapter and then write the next one. And so then, then the next, then the, then we, then the next person would rewrite that chapter and write the sec. So we'd be rewriting, and then the process of rewriting got us up to speed to write the new chapter. And then we got drafts finished, and then we we started to work on. Then we sort of like each rewrite, and, and eventually actually melded to the point where I no longer can exact remember who wrote what, which I guess is what you want, because we just we just polished it again, and even after mm -hmm. thinking it was finished, we did a polish scrap before uploading it to InkShares, and then. Um, once it gets once it gets sort of a critical mass of upvotes and pre-orders, then the, then it goes to publication. But you have a kind of a crowd, which reminds me, I have to actually upload more material for potential readers to explain what this book is about. So that's a different process, um, and also uh, the process of, of writing that book. So there was some planning and then discovery, and then also being surprised by your writing partner in that instance. My other current biggest writing project is not a book; it's actually a. Um, it's a pod, it's a dramatic podcast series, which is okay. sort of akin to writing like a TV series, except it's all audio. And I sold that. I had this idea. It was a film idea. Um, I don't know if it's, it's, it's for adults, more not younger listeners in this case. It kind of, I call it a demon noir. And it takes this um, figure from, Jew, from Jewish folk tales and, and literary lore called Lilith or Leet, who's generally regarded as, as a, a demoness, but also she's kind of a, a figure of sort of uh, repressed female earth-based power kind of has been claimed. There's a magazine named after her and things like that. So I have Lilith in post-war America um, in, in sort of uh, noir and, and, there's, and there's a murder and there may or may not be supernatural elements. And, but without going into intricacies of the plot, I had this idea for a long time. And the practical side of me, I said, well, yeah, I could write this up as a sort of a, a B pop boilery genre film script and it might be a good sample. But then as podcasts got more and more interesting, I thought, but you know, there's probably fewer people doing this kind of stuff for audio. So maybe I should just rework it as audio because there's, instead of being up against like a stack of 50,000 scripts at every producer that no one will ever really get through, um, I, you know, the, it's, it's just not as overwhelmed or as deluged yet the way film and TV spec writing is, for example. So, yeah. so I wrote it, so I outlined it, so I wrote a sample, so I looked at like the format, so I wrote a, an open, like a pilot episode and a sort of a series outline. I mean, like I had three short seasons of like six episodes in mind. And I started to enter podcasts, I started to submit it to podcast producers looking for stuff. And I got a hit right away, like my second submission, I got a producer up in Canada that wants yeah, to produce cool. it at the end of the year. Um, but, but what I thought, my interesting mistake was I thought like TV, once it's a place somewhere, I could help outline the episodes. And then like I just been through this process with my friend Doug, I could maybe write like the first and the last episode and I'd work with other writers to write the middle episodes and there'd be all this kind of parceling out of the work. No, they wanted me to write because there's unlimited resources. They want me to write all six episodes. So it's become <laughs> this enormous but interesting writing task. And, yeah. and I also imagine them as like 15 or 20 minute episodes and they want more like 30 minute episodes. So I'm doubling. So it's this so much more backstory. It's become much more of a, I don't want to say challenge, much more of an exploration than I had imagined, even though I'd outlined things, right? So now I'm in yeah. the actual writing of it. And I still try to surprise myself. Like things happen that I've, the things that I've outlined or made notes give me, they talk me into actually beginning the writing. Like mm -hmm. I can talk myself in to being foolish enough to begin the writing, like <laughs> to go, like to think I, to think I know what I'm doing. So yeah. I imagine I know what I'm doing and that gets me started. And then sometimes it, it, it comports with the notes, but then usually some new thing will happen or it's like, like what? And I ever, Ooh, but this would be cool. 
Or how about and you discover things? So then I do the pantser stuff, and then I I, I surprise myself, and my characters surprise me, or I surprise them sometimes. And then it's not necessarily completely different directions, but things and layers unfold. That you it really that becomes a process. It's, it's like like getting endorphins from jogging. You have to kind of engage in this process to uncover the sort of deeper mind, you know, the, right. The subconscious aspect of storytelling yeah. where you're guided by kind of a, a deeper, maybe wiser and not quite fully conscious <laughs> self, but that's part of the storyteller, the shamanistic parts of the storytellers are, which you don't really talk about in the West much. Right. But it does yeah. come from these roots of, of sort of ecstatic celebration. I mean, you know, bacchanals and things that predated say the Greek when they codified it into drama and more ritualized storytelling. And then later that became pro, you know, all these, these, the way that Western, and West anyway, the way storytelling evolved. But it comes out of these, so you have to kind of access that part of your mind. And so just having enough apparatus or, or structure around you to start that dive is kind of what I'm after. I don't expect all my questions to be answered in an outline or sort of far from it. But I, if it can just give me enough, like, you know, it's just a parachute and convinces me to make the jump. Yeah, it's an outline. And, yeah, right. you know, that's also something that's very important. What you're saying is like, don't allow the outline to be be the thing that controls you. Let right. it be the thing that motivates you. Yeah. And, you know, discovery is a huge part of writing. Even if you're like, I'm going to map out every element that's going to happen. It's like, well, sometimes you're, just, you're writing and you're like, wait a minute. No. Like, let no. me see where I could do this. And That's right. It's it's a valuable tool to learn that discovery. You know, discovery is an actual tool. You know, like to be willing to feel the story out, as you're saying. You know, the the shamans. You know, they they would pass the stories on, and as right. they pass the story, they would develop and become more and more. Um, I really like the, I like the way that you're you're saying that you kind of outline it, but you also do a little discovery, and then you you obviously go back and stuff like that. You you mentioned that it's a six episode uh, season. Right. And something something that I learned uh, while I was writing a series, like if I, I did six episodes, eight episodes, 10 episodes or 12 episodes, um, I personally like to I, I know every episode is supposed to have the full, yeah, uh, you know, the arc, you know right? yeah. yeah, the full arc. Uh, but over the season, I like to also make the episodes have a larger season oh, yeah. uh, outline where you have act one, act two and act three right. over the course. Right. Do you allow uh, each episode to represent certain aspects of the main the, the main storyline over the season? And obviously, each episode is going to have its own thing. How do you break that up when you have a six episode uh, season? Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, it's a good question. I'm feeling my way through it, having never written six episodes. I've written like an episode of a thing as a spec, or I've written a film. You know, like like everybody in America, I've written a film script, right? <laughs> so there was an Esquire cover when I was, I mean, this is a long time ago because they use a typewriter, but there's like a chimpanzee to typewriter. And the cover story was, is anyone in America not writing a film script? And this was uh, <laughs> this was last century, but I think the, the sentiment uh, pertains. But um, but I've never written six, like six continuing episodes of my own. And so this is a new, this is a learning process for me, you know, an old dog with some new tricks, I guess. And, and hopefully I'm, I'm learning them, but what I, I, you do try and have a payoff, but just from watching and absorbing and of course writing books, I guess the, the, anal the analogy for me is in books, each chapter tries to have a payoff and you want to end the chapter in such a way that they, your reader wants to go to the next chapter. And if they have to, you know, close the book for the night or whatever, they're really eager to get back yeah. into it. So, so what I learned about chapters I guess I'm applying to episodes. I mean, you try and end it in such a way that it's it feels coherent, or and 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 it feels like a satisfying enough of a bite, enough of a meal with that episode. That like, okay, that's I've learned now more about the story. It's, I'm not just ripped off. I'm not just being like sold on like I have to tune into the next thing in this case or yeah. download the next thing. Because but but I have now I have a greater sense of what's going on than at the end of the previous episode. But this and this and this have happened, and I'm not going to know how those turn out until I now listen ahead. So you want to keep paying. You want to keep paying off and tantalizing all at once. And that's the trick: pay off and tantalize. Yeah, a payoff. What's that? No, <laughs> <laughs> I just write cool moments, right? I, right. I, I Zach Snyder it, and I'm like, this looks oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> that's right, but yeah. Yeah, we what, don't need motivation. What's it connected to? That's the, yeah. <laughs> but he took his shirt off and the water <laughs> yeah. in front of him. It's yeah. genius. And then he jumps in and swims off. 
Um, <laughs> Now, you know, like one one thing is uh, a good a good rule a good rule of thumb for uh, episodic uh, writers out there, especially if they're listening, is like your first episode could end with the inciting incident, and then you allow the second episode to be oh, yeah. sort of like what they're dealing with because the the inciting incident, you know, and especially if you have eight or or a ten episodes, like Netflix likes to do eight to ten. Right. I've seen twelve. And and that's also this. Have you ever heard of the uh, twenty seven chapter outline, where basically uh, you start your outline with twenty seven chapters, and each chapter is a is a point of a story. So, for example, the first chapter would be their ordinary world. The second chapter would be the inciting incident. The ter- third chapter would be like their immediate reaction to the inciting incident. Mm. Have you ever thir- uh, heard of that method? You mean are those like the hero's journey? Those beats you're talking about, like ordinary uh, world, inciting incident, and it's sort of the, leaving the hero, ordinary world. The hero's journey uh, uses twelve, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I have heard it use eight. Um, <clears throat> the twenty-seven chapter one is sort of it takes each act and breaks it up into three blocks, and each of those blocks also get three uh, breakdowns, and it allows Ooh. you to kind of focus your story, and then from there you can obviously expand, like you could write the inciting incident over the course of three chapters if you want mm-hmm, by expanding right. on the before, during and after. But as, as like a basic guideline for an outline, especially if, if new authors are, are reading chapters, really they control the pace. Like you're allowed to write a chapter, how, you know, you could have a page for a chapter if you really, really That's wanted right. to. Right. Um, so when I'm saying the 27 chapter, it's just trying to say like, what, what am I trying to, what are the 27 most important things I have to hit? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I like to I, I'm usually curious uh, with other writers, like, what is your outlining method? And some people make things up, and you know, because it, it works for them. And other people go, oh, you know, save the cat talks about this. And da, 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 da. Um, I do. I do want to ask you a question, you know, before before we head off and everything yeah. like that. Uh, what are your thoughts on alpha readers and beta readers when dealing with a script? I uh, mean, uh, a novel uh, and or like doing table reads. Like, what do you get out of? Uh, what are you looking for from an alpha reader or a beta reader and also a table read? Like, what are you, what are you getting from that? Well, I, I don't know if I've used all those. I mean, when I was a playwright and I miss playwriting, um, of course you have, you have rehearsal, right? If you're lucky enough to get, I mean, you have to get into shape that somebody wants to produce it. But the assumption is, especially if it's the first time a play has been produced, the assumption is it will change in rehearsal. And so there, there, so there, you know, so you're always that dynamic. I love that dynamic as a writer what actors, I mean, especially if you know, it's a director and a cast that you trust, what they will bring to your work that, that, that you discover as a playwright in, the, in, the, in those first productions. It's been a while since I've done that. I mean, later, then when my storytelling was more formalized, like with Danger Boy, which was traditionally published you know, from Candlewick Press, so they had a traditional publishing structure. And my editor, uh, Monica, she was great with the notes. I mean, you just, if you have an editor, you can trust with notes. So you, have, you, dra- you get a draft in enough shape to show your editor, um, some some writers will work with their agents this way, but you know, in this case, so you show it to your editor, and then each editor is your beta reader in this instance, mm-hmm. um, and she she or he will give you the notes, and if you can trust those notes, and also if you have the kind of relationship where you're free to accept some and you know reject others, um, so you just just clarifying, it's just a matter, of, and then during that process, it's a matter of you stepping away anyway for a little bit, which is usually helpful. And, and then um, seeing it with slightly altered eyes just because you've been away from it. And then if you have these notes from a person you can trust. So that's really, it's just sort of the trusted source. I mean, l- lately, I mean, with um, with the podcast, for example, I'm also sending finished episodes or episode drafts to friends um, just because they were secure. I've been talking about this thing and I said, well, I'll send you one to read it. Because also, I was like, as I got deeper into it, I needed somebody else because I haven't even shown all of them to the producer yet. They're kind of waiting for the full six. So, so it's been great because they, they, it, it seems to mostly coherent to work. And I get something, you know, this, I'll think about this or how about that. And, and so then you proceed. And then once I get them in shape, I know that part of the understanding with the producer is that they're going to give me notes kind of like an editor. And I'm going to go through another whole draft. Which also be easier once it's done. I mean, I'm not, if you think in book terms, I'm not at the end of the draft, right? I'm only in episode four of six right yeah. now. <laughs> I have two more to write. So I'm only two thirds of the way through the book. And I have to, you know, and I have to finish it. And then you have a greater, I, my process, I have a greater understanding of my story 
as I go through it anyway. It's not just sort of manual labor, but the story becomes clearer to me. Like even like in the second Danger Boy book, which is called Trail of Bones, and I had this sort of metaphor. It's a time travel series. It's a, it's a young, young, well, at the time I was writing it in the earlier 2000s, he was from the near future of sort of 2019, 2020, 2021 which is yeah. so now like Jules Verne and everybody's sci-fi set in the past, right? <laughs> but so in Trail of, Bone, Trail of Bones, the second book, he goes back and it was, and he rented a Thomas Jefferson who had this uh, sort of amateur interest in, 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 in archaeology and because they were just discovering the first mammal bones and dinosaur bones in that period. And so it, that was kind of this metaphor about things that were buried and unearthed. But then it also, because of that time of period where he goes back to the slavery and American racial politics. And then I realized Trail of Bones was actually about everything that has remained buried in, in America uh, that's waiting to be unearthed. Sort of yeah. the, the, the truth of it, which I didn't even realize why I was titling my book that until I got to the end of the book, which is set in New Orleans and involves slaves and hopefully soon to be ex-slaves and, and the Underground Railroad and things like that. But that was not, I didn't even know that about my title. This is just the title until I got to the end of the writing the draft. And so are you saying you wrote, you were like, this is the title of my book. And then you kind of worked on it or you thought about what the book was going to be. And then you're like, Oh, a good title would be this. I had the premise and they had a sort of initial title. And for me, sometimes titles, it's almost sometimes a title can help illuminate. I mean, sometimes the title will change, but I also, sometimes the title is the first, well, I'm with danger boy. I mean, I just had this idea that became the title of the series. Like, well, what would they, well, if he's in danger and Oh, and because in my, my son, he also started talking about, swords and dinosaurs at least or dinosaur maybe i heard sword yeah he was like three at the time and working out pronunciation stuff right but i thought okay if there's a sword i'm going to have excalibur because that's like my favorite mythological sword but then there's mm -hmm. dinosaurs and the only way i can plausibly link up excalibur and dinosaurs is going to be time travel of all so now the reason he's a danger boy is because he's in this precarious situation at different moments in history and so it just unfolded from there Honestly, I would like to see dinosaurs with swords. And... I would too. Now, I mean, now, they, they say that Jurassic Park is coming to an end with the new Jurassic World this summer, but we haven't yeah. seen them with swords yet. So, swords and little guns. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, real quick with the beta reader, uh, what what is one kind of note you're looking for from a beta reader? Like, what do you feel is it helpful? No, just, just so authors that are listening when it, when, and if they, and like you said, your editor is your beta reader. Ultimately, what, what is it you're actually looking for from them that would be considered a helpful note to give you a chance to uh, make the book better? Well, it depends if there was a beta reader. I specifically sought out because she or he knew something more about a specific culture, mm -hmm. let's say, or historical that I would, I would want their expertise on the, the very thing, I, I mean, maybe maybe there's a kind of a focus, you know. I have a I have a project, that maybe a picture book that's a maritime and, and lighthouses, and I have a, a friend that was a, a park ranger and he just recently retired in in, in San Francisco and, and maritime on a ship there. So I, I asked for him for this is quite not not beta reading, but I asked for some references for people who knew more about lighthouses than I did, because I had this lighthouse setting that I needed to clarify. So he gave me, and I emailed all the people, and they were very kind. And so, so that's kind of an example. That's at the beginning stage. But, for, but I can also see, like, once I get that, that's on the back burner so far. But, like, once I get th that draft, I might want to seek out some of these people who are, whose expertise is, say, historical lighthouses and say, what – that I get like the, you know, the oil and the lamps and the, you know, mm -hmm. the whalers and the, all these, uh, is this right? I mean, is this, is it right enough for the story to be plausible? So there's levels of expertise. And then there's just sort of the emotional, the, the intuitive emotional uh, response of like, you know, character plausibility. I mean, you know, I'm questioning everything, every single thing, but you know, major motivations. And as long as moments kind of pass muster, but it's really, really believable that a would do this to B because yeah. of you know because of c or whatever you know it's as long definitely as it, important <laughs> right but and you and sometimes you don't know for sure if you're so if it's just you and the screen the fact that these things pass muster or if they don't if they're not plausible it's not working like you thought why not you yeah because we're, we're biased as writers when we're working on our own thing because of yeah. course we already know we, you know, we know what the emotion is. We know where it's going. We know how we got there. So we're seeing it. 
it's mm-hmm. not like we're discovering it as writer as as audience members so it is good to have people read and just be like you know uh i don't know what's going on with these two characters like are they friends and you're like they're yeah. absolutely friends you sure because yeah. they they seem to hate each other and you're like no, you know, like a friend's like if you have to explain it, you're like, OK, I, I have to clean something up. I got to add a little right. thing here and there um, before we go, though. Uh, I just want the, the audience to know I'm going to have all of uh, Mark London Williams uh, information in the uh, description oh, of okay. the video. So you'll be able to find him uh, on Twitter. He's active on Twitter, everyone. I know the Twitterverse uh, likes yeah. the for the uh, writing community for, na- like for now until we'll see what it becomes shortly. But yeah, at the moment active <laughs> on Twitter. That's right. Are you nervous about the Elon Musk thing? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's just a sort of whole right wing hegemony that right. They want to take over. They want to smother any voice. that's not theirs. And they project this out to the left. Yeah. You know, they talk about cancel. I'm because they, I mean, neo-fascists stand for the ultimate cancel culture. That's literally what their politics is about is yeah. about canceling anything that varies from how they think it should be. That's literally like the, the their main plant, their main attitudinal plank. Yeah, they're so, called, yeah. Right. So depending on what what it becomes and what what voices, what kind of toxic voices might be elevated and what I mean, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm not I'm not necessarily preemptively fleeing, but I am taking a wait and see attitude and I'm I'm willing to it's like close shop there if need be. Yeah, well people were saying like um like Elon Musk was like, Hey, I want it to be uh, where people can just, you know, be able to talk free freely. Uh, and I want haters to hate on me, but then someone was like, you, yeah. but you blocked me for hating yeah, on right. you. Right. And it's like, well, you're allowed to hate on me, but I don't have to see it, but I'm not stopping you from being able to say it to the world. I'm stopping because it's bullying me, which is a boundary. Yeah. But I, I think that is the, I, I don't understand why people got upset for him for blocking people. So he doesn't have to see it. It's not like he's blocking them from being able to be represented through it because they could still be like Elon Musk is blank, blank, blank. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think that was that was interesting that they were like, he, freedom of speech is taken away. And you're like, no, no. If you're bullying me, I'm I, I don't I'm going to walk away. I'm not taking away your ability to keep bullying me uh, verbally yeah. to other people. But like my boundary is I don't want to be bullied. Like, why do I want to stand here and just let you make fun of me? You know? I mean, it's a point, but I think the worry is because of this unchecked power that billionaires have in our oh, culture. Well, that, Once yeah. he becomes the owner and he can sit, tweak the rules, I mean, yeah, right now all he can do is block. He can't tell because yeah. he hasn't owned Twitter yet. But I think the worry is if he has that thin a skin, what you know, what could happen once when and if? Because there's still some, you know, it, it may not necessarily it may not be as done a deal as people like to think, but. Yeah, because I what think there's a of, lawsuit that that yeah. blocked it right now. Um, but yeah, there was. Some, I don't know if this is 100 percent true. It's just I was reading uh, that Elon Musk uh, he ended up canceling someone's order uh, that was a blogger, and they had said something poorly about Elon Musk, so he, he canceled their their uh, Tesla, Tesla order. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I just read it, yeah. you know, on, on yeah. multiple outlets, and I was just like, it was funny to me, but at the same time, yeah. like you know. Uh, it was just a, he, he's an interesting guy. I mean, the guy started with his brother living in a in a um, an office to do AOL. But then you have to remember he's from South Africa, and his right. family were rich as it was, so it wasn't like that's they right. were living poor. And technically, he's homeless. I don't know if you know about this, like because he doesn't own a home. He just like lives like he just travels. Yeah, I just recently. Oh, <laughs> I just. Do- Are we buffering here? I, th- I think you did for one second there. Go ahead. You're back, you're back on air. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, yeah, I, I just recently read about that myself, and it kind of surprised me that he was like a, the world's richest couch surfer, you know, but he has a family, so where do they go? Yeah, well, you know, they probably try, you know, like I'm sure they could go anywhere they want, you know. But, um, but anyway, so well, like, right. hey, Mark, I, I, I really want to thank you for, uh, for coming out, man. This is um... – I'm, I'm you're my first guest i just want you to know that oh Early wow year. we're an oh wow gosh okay yeah yeah, yeah. you cut the ribbon <laughs> wow wow i should have bought a big a big scissors a big ceremonial scissors to do that way yeah yeah i, I was hoping for blurry background but honestly i like the paintings i like the uh i, I know you're, you're you're like the fruiter back there right is that the is that the fruiter back there? I can't tell. Um, but anyway. Oh, yeah. That might be. And then there's, there's like a Blade Runner still. And then I, that painting of my, my late grandma. Did the, she used to do these dishes. There's a painting from my grandma. 
uh, movie stills, all kinds of, you know, a whole bricolage of it's like a, stuff. <laughs> it's a history stuff. in the making of you. Uh, you, um, if you want, like, you, you were saying you have a book that you're working on right now and you have the uh, podcast. Uh, is, is there a way for people to uh, see the um, status of those things? Yeah, or, I think for um, shares, I mean, I can also send you the link. And if you want to put that when this goes on, um, hopefully the, yeah. you have to be my understanding with ink shares. I'm new to it too. You have to be a member. You have to sign up there. I mean, it's not like a membership, but you have to sign up there. Then you can read about the project, which is called Noir is the New Black. And it's on ink shares. And it's going to be in this, this sort of beta phase where we're going to get feedback. And a couple chapters will be available to read there. And part of the process is we solicit comments from readers. And I will, I will be uploading more uh, background about the book. And then once it reaches a critical mass, then uh, the ink shares powers it because they have distribution channels. And so then they put it into print. And then it becomes available both as a book and an ebook, and then, you know, available to libraries and bookstores, et cetera. Okay. All right. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. All right, uh, Mark. Uh, again, thank you so much for being a guest. Uh, I'm I'm extremely appreciative of your time, and uh, you know, I, I'd like to have you again for season two or even season three love if you're to. available. Love to, love to come back, and it's, maybe I'll blur the background next time and be more discreet. Oh yeah, or or, you know, or just swap out. I can just put different stuff on the walls. And maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or like one thing, be like that's all right. Different. Yeah, yeah, do the Where's Waldo <laughs> thing. What's the one thing that's different? <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, sure. We'll see you next time, and uh, take care, and uh, right. work work on creating the right mindset. That's right. <laughs> All right, Thomas. Take-